This question will define the future of our species. Is it right to apply genetic editing to human embryos? Should we let nature continue to randomly select which embryos are born, or should we decide which ones are fit to be born? For the first time in human history, we have enough tools to direct our evolution and decide our future as a species, to determine which genes we want to keep and which we want to discard. Directed selection is not new to humans. Thanks to directed selection, we transform this into this and this into this. Many of the products we enjoy daily are here because humans have been selecting the best specimens for millions of years. However, there are also some famous cases where the ideology of improving the race led powerful people to commit atrocities. Today a new door opens, but are we really ready as a society to enter? Let's talk about it, from the most relaxed to the most hardcore. The first human birth from an in vitro conceived embryo occurred in 1978 with Louise, nicknamed the test tube baby, being born in England. Louise's mother, Leslie Brown, had tried to conceive for nine years but had blocked fallopian tubes, preventing natural conception. The IVF technique, or in vitro fertilization, used to conceive Louise Brown, has been the basis of assisted reproductive technology that has helped millions of couples have children. The development was so significant that Robert Edwards, who brought Louise into the world, won the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine in 2010 for developing in vitro fertilization. Many things have happened since that first birth in 1978, but broadly, the method remains the same. Eggs are retrieved from the mother and fertilized with the father's sperm, turning the fertilized eggs into embryos that are kept in the lab for a few days to allow development. Finally, one or more embryos are transferred to the woman's uterus. If one of the embryos attaches to the uterine lining, a pregnancy occurs. Although the method has caused some ethical and legal controversy from its beginnings, it has generally been well accepted by the population. Eventually, someone said, Hey, if we already have the embryos out here, we can surely do something to them before implanting. This gave rise to pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, PGT, a very important test. The most common reason a transferred embryo doesn't result in pregnancy is due to naturally occurring genetic problems in the embryos. Thus, genetic diagnosis can ensure that the selected embryo for transfer is healthy and viable, aiming to avoid the presence of diseases like Huntington's disease, sickle cell anemia, muscular dystrophy, cystic fibrosis, among others. All these diseases have one thing in common. They are monogenic diseases, meaning they are caused by a single gene. Therefore, it's easy to analyze the DNA to determine if the embryo is positive for these diseases. Up to this point, everything seems fine, right? We all agree that this is a type of directed selection where the best candidates are selected based on their health and the less viable candidates are discarded. This is good because we want the babies to be born healthy and free from these diseases. These are good news for the couple trying to conceive and for society, as we all benefit from having healthier people in the world. Moreover, various tests are already conducted on women during their pregnancies when these are natural, making it possible to determine the health of the baby. Thus, we could say that the technology, although not cheap, is relatively accessible to everyone. What we just discussed is the basic IVF package because innovation doesn't stop. And recently, companies like Genomic Prediction have come to market, wanting to take embryo testing to the next level. Today, they offer a service with various tests that can rank embryos and select the one with the best genetics. For now, the tests focus solely on selecting the embryo less likely to suffer from diseases like schizophrenia, diabetes, cancer, and heart problems. However, the creator's plans include determining other phenotypes in the future, such as whether the baby will be prone to obesity. Genomic Predictions Technology introduces a method known as PGTP, which translates to Polygenic Pre-Implantation Genetic Diagnosis. This last word is important. Unlike the diseases we discussed earlier, like Huntington's and cystic fibrosis, which are monogenic, the latter diseases are polygenic, meaning they are caused by the interaction of multiple genes. In fact, most diseases are polygenic and multifactorial, meaning many genes interact with each other and the environment to manifest the disease. For genomic predictions test, 
A DNA sample is taken from each embryo and compared with databases where the presence of a variant correlates with the likelihood of developing a specific condition during life. The method is much more statistical, using population information to determine which genes are found in people with certain conditions to make its predictions. In this case, it only reduces the probability of developing schizophrenia or cancer, but of course they can still occur because many genes interact. This technology still has many areas of opportunity. For instance, it needs to expand the databases used to increase the accuracy of the analyses, and the error rate is often very high. Note that to take advantage of this type of technology, the pregnancy must be carried out through IVF. Natural pregnancies cannot benefit from this technology. A series of embryos from the couple are needed to run the tests and rank them, meaning several embryos are required. If you complained that teachers were tough when grading you in kindergarten, now you will fail before being born. Once we start with these ranking systems and increase the databases, it won't be long before we can choose not only the healthiest embryo, but also the tallest, the most athletic, the one with genes related to higher IQ, the one who won't go bald. The limit is almost infinite. Again, let's review this so far. Do we all still agree? Couples have the right to choose the best for their offspring, and in turn, the children born from these embryos have the right to live lives free of diseases. Even if we only improve their chances of not suffering from cancer or diabetes by a certain percentage, it's worth it, because it means fewer people will suffer from these terrible diseases. The method is definitely not cheap and not available to everyone, but with its use as a society, we hope that its cost will decrease and eventually be available to those who can use it. Do we agree that rich people have access to it, with the hope that it will eventually become cheap enough for everyone to access this type of selection? How do you feel about this idea? How do you feel about the idea if the child will not only be perfectly healthy, but parents can also decide their appearance, intelligence quotient, and social abilities? Do you think it's fair for certain people to come into the world with these pre-programmed advantages while others are victims of chance? But isn't it better for humanity to have better humans? In the end, we all benefit if there are smarter people developing new technologies. We all benefit if there are healthier people. Eventually, these selected humans would reproduce with non-selected humans, and thus we all benefit from this improved genetics. But then, how do we define what is improved genetics when we leave the realm of health and disease? Why would being tall be better? Why would we choose a child who won't lose their hair over one who will go bald at 20? How do we avoid falling into eugenics? In a world that still hasn't resolved fundamental issues of racism, how do we introduce a new component of division into this equation? While you consider these questions, technological development does not stop. Let's move to the next level. Remember when you were little and didn't know you had done something wrong? You happily went to tell your mom what you had done without knowing you were earning a spanking? In the video, we see He Jong Kui happily announcing his latest feat he had brought into the world two genetically modified babies. After publishing his announcement, He Jiang Kui disappeared for 13 weeks by the Chinese government and spent the next three years in prison for medical malpractice. At the same time, he received international scientific community disapproval, which was outraged when they learned what he had done. It was unthinkable that He Jiang Kui had altered the DNA of embryos and brought them to term. It was not only unthinkable, it was illegal. In fact, it is completely banned in over 70 countries. But as with everything in life, the devil is in the details. So let's talk about the full story. He Jiang Kui is a Chinese scientist who caused a great scandal in 2018 when he announced in this video that he had genetically edited two twin girls before their birth. For gene editing, he used a tool called CRISPR-Cas9 to modify a gene in the embryos with the aim of making them immune to HIV. CRISPR will have a dedicated video. This is a quick summary just for context. It is possibly the most revolutionary thing humans have invented in recent years. Just as the steam engine led to the Industrial Revolution, this tool could lead us to the next great revolution, genetic editing. However, humans didn't really invent anything. CRISPR is something we discovered and learned to use since CRISPR is naturally found in bacteria as part of their immune system. The most simplified way to see CRISPR is like having a robot. 
This is what our robot looks like in real life. This gray cluster is a protein, and the red strip is RNA. On a very simplified level, our robot does two things, find and cut. To do its job, this robot called Cas9 needs us to give it a description of what it should find. The description in this case is this RNA fragment we call guide RNA because it guides the robot to find a specific DNA sequence. Our robot knows it has found the sequence when the RNA it carries matches perfectly with the DNA strand. When this happens, the robot's second function, cutting, is activated, breaking the DNA strand. After cutting the strand, our body will try to repair it, but this process can lead to errors, resulting in genes being turned off. What makes this system so special is that we can change the guide RNA strand to whatever we want, and thus our molecule will find exactly the sequence we want to affect. Finding and cutting is the most basic function of CRISPR-Cas9 because researchers have gone crazy, and now it almost makes you breakfast, but we'll talk about that later. What you need to know is that CRISPR is the simplest, most precise, and cheapest way to edit DNA. How cheap? About 90% cheaper, very cheap, making gene editing much more accessible. With access, many more experiments and new applications can be found. CRISPR is super promising, but remember, the technology is new. We don't yet know the long-term effects of CRISPR editing. We don't know if editing one gene affects other areas of DNA. Additionally, the technology is not perfect, and sometimes cuts where it shouldn't, finding similar sequences, which can cause more changes than planned, which can be catastrophic for an organism. For these reasons, the use of CRISPR in humans is limited and mainly in very, very, very controlled exploratory studies. In the video, He Jiang Kui explains that the goal of the genetic editing in the embryos was to prevent them from contracting the HIV virus carried by their parents. According to his account, the parents were aware of the procedure and its risks, but accepted it because they wanted to ensure their children would not be condemned to live with HIV. All this sounds super noble. Poor babies saved from HIV. But let's be clear from now on, no, it was not noble. There are proven, cheap, and super accessible methods to prevent embryos and babies from contracting HIV. Every day, babies are born to HIV-positive mothers and live healthy lives without the virus. No, it wasn't to save the babies from living condemned by HIV. It was to test a new scientific method. It was a personal interest. Another detail. When the news of He's experiments became public, the scientific community was outraged because it is currently not accepted to use gene editing to make changes that can be passed on to future generations. Now, what is the difference between the CRISPR edits that excite us and those that worry us? The difference is the cells in which the genetic editing is done. The first thing you need to know is that the cells in your body can be divided into two groups, somatic cells and germline cells. Somatic cells are the cells that make up our body and perform all functions like walking, talking, breathing, digesting, thinking. They are the cells of your liver, kidney, brain, heart, bones, muscles. Somatic cells make up what comes to mind when you think of your body. The other type of cells, germline cells, are the cells that will make your children. These are eggs or sperm, depending on what you are. Germline cells are the cells that will form your offspring. There are body cells and cells for the children we haven't had but carry around. The CRISPR that excites us is the one that makes edits in somatic cells. As we discussed, this is still under study to determine how safe and effective it is with current technology, but it is very promising. Even so, with all the promise it holds, let's say everything goes wrong and the correction worsens things. This is very bad, but when done in somatic cells, the error stays only in that individual, the one who accepted the risks and wanted to participate in the study or use the technique. In other words, you took a risk, and it went bad, but that's where it ends, with you. But if we use CRISPR to modify germline cells, and again, everything goes wrong, that error would be inheritable to future generations, impacting all descendants. If these CRISPR-affected people relate to others, the error would continue to spread, and the consequences could be much greater. Again, it's not to scare you. CRISPR is incredibly promising and will likely revolutionize the future of health. 
but the function of many genes is complex, and a seemingly harmless modification can lead to unforeseen and unintended effects. That's why studies and studies are run, thousands of preclinical phases, millions of in vitro studies. This cumulative information helps make technologies truly safe. That's why, until we have these tons of information, the scientific community disapproves of making modifications to germline cells. All of us were at one point just one cell, and this cell divided to generate two cells, which divided to form four cells, and so on, until we became the person walking down the street today. By editing when the babies were just a couple of cells, it means they will have the modification in all their cells, including the germline cells. Not only do we not know the effect on the baby's health, but we also don't know the effect on future generations. He used CRISPR to deactivate a gene called CCR5 in the two embryos. The CCR5 gene is part of the immune system, and the receptor it produces is exploited by the HIV virus to infect our cells. His idea was simple. Alter the DNA that the CCR5 protein is not there, and thus HIV has no way to enter the cells, resulting in babies immune to HIV. Even if everything had gone according to He's plan, his experiment was extremely risky for the babies and their future descendants. The problem is that things did not go according to plan. Although he reported that the babies were born perfectly healthy in November 2018, he also observed that the resulting mutation in the CCR5 gene was different from the natural mutation he sought to replicate. This new mutation is unknown to us. We don't know its effects on the functioning of the baby's white blood cells and their immune response. Additionally, in at least one of the babies, the editing was not completed, meaning some embryonic cells were edited while others were not, resulting in mosaicism. This means the baby has an organism with cells with different DNA sequences. In this case, the baby has the mutation but won't be immune to HIV since the mutation is not present in all her cells. She will have cells that can be entered by HIV. To this day, we do not know if he's work protected the children from HIV or if it generated side effects. We know nothing about Lulu and Nana, the names of the girls born. Only he and the Chinese government know their whereabouts and the results of his experiments. For his part, since He Jiankui left prison, he announced his project to establish a laboratory in Beijing, aiming to develop therapies against other hereditary diseases. Despite the three years in prison, he continues his life normally without consequences, regardless of Lulu and Nana's fate. Yes, the rules based on scientific consensus have a reason for being. They are not to stop the advancement of science or to defend certain interests. They are there to protect people. Everything that went wrong in this experiment was expected because we obviously do not fully control the technology. It has not been studied enough and still has areas of opportunity. There are processes designed to advance such technologies safely without impacting innocent lives. It's simply a matter of time and following procedures for technologies to advance and become safe. Finally, with the arrival of the first genetically modified babies, a new door opens. The technologies are not safe today, but in a few years they will be, and then we will not only be able to choose the best embryo, we will be able to design the best embryo, design embryos superior in the aspects we decide. This is a space for reflection. Last time we left with the question of how we decide one characteristic is superior to another, speaking only of natural characteristics in humans. Now, if modifications to DNA are practically infinite, what about tastes that fall outside the norm or the natural? If a couple wants to have a child with green skin, do they have the right to do so? Or does the child have the right to be born with a skin considered natural? What about access to this technology? This technology will definitely take many more years to become accessible to everyone. What will happen in the meantime? Those with access will have advantages over the rest. Better health, better bodies, better mental capacities, they might even delay their aging. We must not forget that today these differences already exist. Greater resources allow people access to better treatments and better health. This would just add an extra step that separates people with resources from those without. What will happen to people who defend naturalism over genetic synthesis and refuse to participate? Will we become different races then? If you had the opportunity to design the best characteristics you can imagine for your offspring, 
Would you ignore it and leave it to chance that they are healthy babies? Or would you prefer to ensure they are healthy babies? It is very important that as a society, we reflect on these questions because society is responsible for guiding legislation and technological development in each country. Currently, in Mexico, our legislation prohibits the selection of embryos not related to health issues and bans any research on embryos in this area. In our country, the door is closed. Science cannot learn more about our genetic traits as Mexicans at this fundamental stage, the embryonic stage. On these topics, everyone has their opinion, and if you ask the PN, National Action Party, which proposed the General Law on Assisted Human Reproduction, regulating IVF procedures in our country, the most important opinion is that of religious groups. I'm not making this up. It says so in the working document that generated the regulation. The legislative proposals of the PAN endorsed by conservative and religious groups because, obviously, we all agree that science should be directed by Opus DEI. The document also includes the opinions of more liberal parties and, finally, the scientific community's stance, which pointed out that the legislative proposals have technical and scientific errors, basically begging them to use science for legislation. Obviously, the PN said, LOL, no, and the law was approved. The law, of course, defends the rights and dignity of the embryo, bans its use for studies, and also bans abortion, the basic conservative package. Look, friends, we need to be clear. We all have the right to our own opinions. You can have your ideas and be for or against, but there is something we cannot do. Turn our backs on these debates because, whether we want it or not, technology will keep advancing. If it doesn't advance in Mexico to benefit Mexicans, it will do so elsewhere. The best we can do is inform ourselves and seek legislation that truly protects the people who could benefit from using this technology while making it accessible to the general public. Really, all we need is to stay informed. Being well informed on these topics makes us valuable pieces in the debate and allows us to discern what benefits us all the most. What will the future of our species be with these technologies? We do not know, but if we turn our backs on these issues, we won't be part of the guidelines that will build this new world. Only one thing is certain. Progress will not stop. While writing this script, a new piece of news was published. Scientists in England have developed synthetic human embryos using stem cells. It is no longer even necessary to use eggs or sperm to create these embryos. Although the synthetic embryos only form rudimentary structures, it could open the door to understanding the most basic stages of human development. Interestingly, these embryos fall outside existing laws in most countries, including the UK.